are. All righty. Welcome, welcome, everybody. We are live on Thursday Night Live with Airway Circle. We have a very special guest today. I'm going to share my screen so you guys on Facebook can see what I can see. Let's see, share. And then I'm going to introduce the speaker. And make sure I get the right one. Okay, I'm going to introduce the speaker. And then we are going to start. I know it's a little bit late today. I apologize. Which one? There is my drive. All right. Here we go. Today with us, we have Dr. R. Arthur. Dr. Arthur, tell me again. Feigenbaum. Feigenbaum practices. He practices dental sleep medicine full time in New York. He is the director of dental sleep medicine for Pro Health Dental and Delta Sleep Center of Long Island. Dr. Feigenbaum is a graduate of Tufts School of Dental Medicine and a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. He is presently chair of the annual meeting committee for the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine and co-chair for the AADSM Pediatric Airway course. He's also current president of the Queens County Dental Society and serves as numerous committees for the NYSDA, QCDS, and AADSM. Dr. Feigenbaum co-founded Dental Sleep International and has lectured nationwide on the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea using oral appliance therapy. We all need to learn more about oral appliance therapy. That's why I begged him to be here tonight. Uh, so today's topic is overcoming challenges in dental sleep medicine. Welcome to Airway Circle. You know, I was a general dentist for like over 30 years in a small general dental practice. And it just happened that my physician was boarded in sleep. And I went to him year after year my annual checkups. And last few years I was going to him, he said, why don't you get yourself involved in sleep? And I kept on saying, no, 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 no. And then one year he came to me and said, when do you get involved in sleep and work in my office? And that's how my journey began in, in dental sleep medicine. And I'm much appreciative of him um, for getting me involved here. And uh, I'm just going to go and actually Actually, this presentation, the slides are in a different order, so <laughs> you'll, you'll just excuse me for that. But You're you know, totally fine. Do you want to make it into presentation mode so we can see the whole screen? Uh, All the uh, way up, well, me, one, two, three, yes. four. Let me just go with this if, if I can, okay? Okay. So initially, I realized there's a problem in dental sleep medicine, and we did our best to try to make changes. So my goal was to change from within. That was my mission. We initially started what we call Delta Sleep International. This is about 10 years ago. And it was addressing the business trends in dental sleep medicine. Um, there was a lacking of this. I joined forces with very elite members in dental sleep medicine community, including Dr. Ben Smith, Lown and Scott Craig, and we developed this forum and conducted courses on the business trends. The things we in, in, installed in this in this um, Delta Sleep International business business was we created panel discussions and billing roundtables, which was later used in the annual meetings. Then I became a member of the board of trustees of the Queens County Dental Society. I eventually became president. And my goal here was to enhance awareness of sleep disorder breathing. I did many lectures for them. I wrote articles not only for the state journal, but also for the Queens County Dental Society um, bulletins. And then eventually I volunteered for the annual meeting committee. And after a while, became vice chair and eventually chair. And the goal here was to make meetings more based and more respected, which I think we've been accomplishing. I became the director at and my goal here was to guide dentists to implement training to raise awareness. Um, I spoke at other organizations such as the ASM, and this is actually where we, me and Renata met. 
Renata, do you remember that? I do. I was asking you some questions. <laughs> do you remember what I was doing there? It was about dentist physician interaction. And I got a panel discussion, dentists and physicians, and we rose awareness for the physician community about what we do in dental sleep medicine. And most recently, um, I decided to create a pediatric course that was an add-on course for the AADSM annual meeting. So this is going to be held the day before the annual meeting in May. And Renata, you were instrumental in this, by the way. Um, Renata is one of the people I initially called and asked for suggestions for speakers. And she was very kind to enable me to have uh, some really great names coming to the meeting. Um, some that you know, like Audrey Yoon and David Gozell and Darius Lomini uh, and many, many others. So a wonderful event. And Renata, I'll see you there. And I'm sure I have a lot of the people on this meeting there as well. I'm also now on the task force for continuing education for the membership as well. So I wanted to start with something else, but we'll go from here. I don't, I don't consider myself an expert. I'm experienced. I see problems and I try to fix them. I'm known as a complainer to many because if I see something I don't like, I make it well known. But I do seek out the help from others like Renata. And I attend meetings of other organizations and networking is a key. This is how I got to where I am by networking. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little about some of the basics of dental sleep medicine and sleep medicine, understanding the symptoms, the importance of practicing or, or screening for, for sleep disorder breathing, the obstacles, some appliances and my complaints about them. And also at the end, if we have time, I know we're running late already, but if we have time, I would like to um, ask you guys for suggestions for speakers and events, continue education events. So I have a lot of pet peeves and I'm going to discuss this with you. So as far as oral appliance therapy, how complicated can it be? I mean, a lot of dentists believe it's just a matter of taking impressions or doing a scan, taking a bite. How difficult can that be? I mean, the problem is they understand what they don't understand. So I do train dentists to do this. And the keys are to understand a proper protocol, understand a medical condition, understand the symptoms, be qualified, and according to the AADSM, being qualified is uh, taking the mastery program, and of course, understand oral appliances and treatment. So the proper protocol, and I've lectured on the standard of care several times for the AADSM, is first of all, understand the screening process. We have our patients out in a waiting room, fill out questionnaires about sleep. Make sure we look at the medical history. If there's any comorbid conditions, do the intraoral exam. In other words, look for large tongue or large tonsils or whatever. And actually just look at the patient. See if they have a large neck or they're obese. Something that would indicate sleep apnea. Then the physician referral. What I say is we're treating this patient together with a physician. We're not treating them alone. So... We need to get the sleep referral from the physician. We have to get sleep tested. We got to get a letter of medical necessity. And of course, if you're using insurance and approval, then we have them come back for the impression or scan, followed by a, about the insertion, which is, takes about three weeks, then follow up visit. And it's very important to get an efficacy test to show how well the appliance is working. Uh, and then placed on recall. And Stay in constant communication with the MD. Now, again, if you're not qualified and you don't know the standard of care, you will not be doing this. So, again, the screening, as I said, the only thing I'll add to that is about new technology. I mean, I'm encouraged about the wearables out there now. Some of these are even able to get you a diagnosis of sleep apnea just by wearing a ring. I think that's fascinating. 
and encouraging about where raising awareness. So should a dentist treat or not to treat? First of all, they should understand this condition, get their process in place, like the protocol and billing, and know your appliances. You should be an expert on several appliances and understand the standard of care. What an oral appliance is simple, simply do is we open up the airway by moving the lower jaw forward as diagrammed in these photos. The CPR is basically you're advancing and stabilizing the mandible, you're improving the oral pharyngeal geometry during sleep, and increasing the volume primarily in the lateral dimension of the velopharynx. There's something no known as the jaw thrust maneuver, where that's used for patients' injuries. And in this case, they just put their index finger, middle finger underneath the angle of the man. And this is exactly what we're doing with an oral appliance. Also very important to understand the symptoms. Snoring is created by the flapping vibration of the relaxed tissue in the mouth and throat. You may snore and not have sleep apnea, or it may have sleep apnea and not snore. I mean, a lot of dentists will do an oral appliance. They see the snoring removed or eliminated, and they think it's cured, but it's not. I mean, you could have, you have plenty of silent apneics out there. Start gasping for air. So that is fairly distinctive of sleep apnea, but there are other conditions that can be involved in gasping. It's not necessarily sleep apnea. Daytime injury. Tiredness is an interesting symptom. Not everybody is tired. I've had severe patients that are just not tired. One in four with moderate sleep apnea won't experience daytime tiredness. I always use the worth score, which shows me disease alleviation, but it's not diagnostic of sleep apnea. There are many conditions that would cause tiredness. Morning headaches. The airways were repetitively, partially completely obstructed during sleep. Oxygen in your blood being transported to the brain is reduced. Increased risk of serious conditions like high blood pressure, heart attack and stroke, as well as headaches, specifically morning headaches. Nocturia is becoming more and more distinctive of sleep apnea, just as much as snoring is. So many patients with nocturia have sleep apnea. 84% of sleep apnea patients report frequent nighttime urination. It produces a, a hormone like protein, AMP, excreted by the heart, and that acts as a diuretic. And in response to increase in blood pressure, it tells the body to eliminate liquid. Poor concentration and decreased attention. Sleep apnea causes chemical changes in the brain that don't function as well. Unrestored of sleep caused by frequent arousals. And I see so many patients with sleep apnea and GERD. And this works as a bidirectional pathway, meaning GERD can induce and worsen the effect of sleep apnea, while it can work in a reverse direction. And impotence in men. So sleep apnea can cause lower testosterone levels, dipping in oxygen. 69% of males surveyed with OSA reported erectile dysfunction. This is a serious problem and should not be ignored or minimized. It is highly related to all these conditions. Drug resistant hypertension, 83% of those patients have sleep apnea, congestive heart failure, diabetes 2, stroke, pacemakers, arrhythmias, coronary heart disease, AFib, all about 50% and over. So who has sleep apnea? I mean, me and my buddies used to go to restaurants here in New York and go to the bar and look around and see who we thought we had sleep apnea. And we inevitably picked out the middle-aged, overweight man. Um, we miss so many patients that way. Because as we all know, sleep apnea comes in any age, in any form, any body shape. Anybody can have it. We all do cancer screening. There is, it shows that 10 and a half adults per 100,000 will de develop oral cancer. In comparison, one out of five patients or people with um, OSA, one out of five have OSA, at least mild OSA. So who should do the screening? And my answer to that is everybody. I mean, enough patients out there that everybody has to do this. 
I mean, nurses, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, doctors, everybody in the dental office, starting from the front desk on, really needs all hands on deck. There are a billion people worldwide that have sleep apnea. 70% heart attack patients have OSA. 43% of patients with mild OSA have hypertension. 83% of obese type 2 diabetic patients have OSA. So on and so on and so on. William DeMent, who is often known as the father of sleep medicine, quoted, sleep apnea remains the most undiagnosed deadly problem in medicine. Adam Benjafield did a study. Um, he actually looked at 16 countries, I believe, and he's the one that said that there's a billion people worldwide, uh, starting with China, USA, Brazil, and India, which have the highest numbers of sleep apnea patients, but there are even countries that had over 50% prevalence. And what about the burden on healthcare? If you look at this study from 2015, $150 billion were spent because of sleep apnea. Workplace accidents, motor vehicle accidents, comorbid diseases, lost productivity. Now, I always show this picture. If any of you heard me lecture before, this is a photo actually of my mom before I was born. And, you know, she unfortunately passed away at the age of 73. Um, she had, she, as she became older, and I'll show you, that's actually me on the, your left with the mustache when I was younger, if you're all curious. But my mom became overweight. You see the large neck. She had diabetes too. She had took naps in the afternoon. She snored. She had congestive heart failure. She had chronic venous insufficiency. She had everything. But did anybody even suspect sleep apnea? And the answer was no, because in 1997. Now we're in 2023. I mean, it's ridiculous that we're still not screening efficiently to get these patients into treatment. And this is what motivates me to do what I do at this time. As far as the oral examination goes, I mean, we should look at the overbite and overjet, the crossbite, the arch form, if they brux or not, acid erosion, scalloping of the tongue. We always look at the malampati score, tonsils, frenal attachments. Patients come in, they complain of some th such things as snoring, stopping breathing, daytime tiredness, awaken unrefreshed, morning headaches, poor concentration, nocturia, de performance deficiency, memory loss, insomnia. I mean, it's our job as dentists and hygienists and myofunctional therapists to listen to people and to talk to them and indicate to them the importance of getting treatment because this could affect their standard of life. Also look at the physical examination. Does a patient come in with a retruded mandible? Are they a mouth breather? Do they have that tired or depressed look? Do they have that uh, craniocervical extension, nasal patency issues, neck size? All this you can tell by just looking at the patient. We should all look at the mouth very carefully and not just see teeth and gums. Look and the, the, the overbite, the overjet, the narrow arch, the large tongue, the scalping of the tongue, the proxism, all this and these, just these few pictures. It is so important to work out a great relationship with a physician. The patient needs to be screened by the dentist to send for the physician, or the physician has to refer back to the dentist. But the key is we have to work on this patient together. Creating an, a close relationship with a physician is so important for me, and it should be important for everybody. I give my physician screening tools. I start a relationship with them. They all have my cell phone number. We call back and forth about procedures, about patients, you know, whatever it is. You know, and to meet the physician, I suggest face-to-face -face meetings, lunch and learns, just a few minutes together, dinner is my best way of meeting doctors, understand what their goals and what communication they need. You know, whether they need soap notes on every visit, you know, talk to them, Sh share clinical studies and new developments, show your expertise. Do not go into a physician's office not knowing what you're talking about. 
And very importantly, you must track patients. Losing a patient in a crowd is never a good thing. You're treating these patients together. Also provide them with samples. Oral appliance therapy, and this was in a study by Kate Sutherland out of Australia. Uh, the effectiveness equation, which many of us have heard about, efficacy times compliance equals effectiveness. Which is more effective, the oral appliance or the CPAP? It can be argued that the oral appliance may be more effective because with CPAP, so few of them can tolerate it, under 50%. But with oral appliances, they're very well tolerated. There is no difference in subjective daytime tiredness, driving performance, short-term effects on blood pressure, improved endothelial function, and reduced mortality related rates between CPAP and oral appliance therapy. So let's talk about some of the problems that I face. You know, number one is physicians. They have an average visit of 15 minutes. They spend five minutes on the longest topic and the remaining minutes, of remaining topics each one minute each. I mean, that's crazy to be able to screen a patient properly. So that is one of the problems. Access of care issues. There are about 200,000 dentists, but there are only about 7,500 sleep physicians in the U.S., and that's decreasing. I mean, the reason for that, in the old days, it used to be grandfather when you got boarded in critical care. You also could get sit for the test for sleep, but that's no longer the case. So there are less and less physicians going into sleep. So can PCPs effectively screen for OSA? And the answer is probably not. They need our help. So let's talk about some of the obstacles. The physician's not screening or referring. Lack of awareness by all. That includes the public, physicians, and dentists. Certainly, insurance companies create a problem for us. Medicare. I also have a problem with the demagogues out there, and I'll talk about that shortly. And then industry, you know, there are companies out there that want to sell their products, create continuing education to sell it, and they can give you some decent information, but you have to be careful. Just don't buy something because they say you should buy it. So some of the problems with physicians is that a lot of them are just uneducated about oral appliances, even sleep physicians. They're more comfortable with CPAP. I mean, this comes from arrogance. The concern about losing patient, that's sometimes the case. They, if they refer a patient to, they don't want to USA with a patient. They don't have the time to screen, as we discussed. The concern about the patient course, I mean, there have been horror stories about that. And they've also often had bad experiences with dentists. So I understand where they're coming from. So some of the comments I've heard from physicians are like this. And these are actual comments that physicians gave to me. Does the physician cover it? I'm sorry, does the insurance cover it? Heard of patients paying a fortune for these. So physicians, a lot of physicians aren't, and this includes sleep physicians, aren't even aware that medical insurance covers these things. I had one physician right upstairs from me recently, says she doesn't believe in oral appliances. She used tongue retaining devices only. Um, I had a problem with that. I told her, you know, I gave her some literature to read. Um, she's a veteran, so it's hard to change people's minds, but that's a problem. I've had physicians come with it. Do they work? Again, read the literature. I had this patient, he was sitting in a chair, he had severe sleep apnea, and I called up the doctor, physician, the sleep physician, and I told him I need an Rx for an appliance. He said to me, the patient is doing well with CPAP. And I said to him, he's not using a CPAP. And a patient was sitting right in my chair. And the guy wouldn't write me a script. I mean, it's just incredible what goes out, th out there. Insurance companies won't cover it. Not true. CPAP works on all patients. I see this a lot too. I had very reputable sleep physicians. All they do is CPAP. They don't even know when the patient is failing CPAP because the patient does tell them. I had a patient... A couple of weeks ago, he came in, he came from a sleep physician's office. And what the sleep physician told him is it just changed masks. And the, the patient asked him, 
I want an oral appliance. And the doctor says, I don't refer to oral for oral appliances. Just happened that his dad came to me for an oral appliance, recommended him, and he finally got to me. And it worked well for him. So there are a lot of problems for, phys- for physicians. And the solutions, obviously, are better education for them. And I'm out there doing what I can to change that. Comments from dentists. So, again, I always recommend, I insist that dentists become experts in sleep. I mean, my dentists, I work at a DSO and I train dentists there. They need to take the mastery program and then they have clinical training with me. I mean, I've heard these responses for some of my dentists. The dentist did an oral plans for a patient and a response was, it seems to work. I mean, that's not good enough. I mean, you have to get the patient back in efficacy test, see how they're doing. I mean, it seems to work, doesn't work, period. I mean, how do you know it seems to work? There is no way. Hasn't returned, but he seems better. I mean, I almost have a heart attack when I hear statements like this. And as I told you, I'm a complainer. Comments from patients. And these, again, actual comments I've heard from patients. This top one, my orthodontist gave me appliance three years ago, but don't think it is helping. Patient came in to me, showed me the appliance. The orthodontist never gave him any education on how to protrude the appliance. He was wearing an appliance that wasn't doing anything for three years. He charged him $5,000, gave him no instruction. He didn't even give him the key to advance it. And he finally got to me and I was able to make him a new appliance. But, you know, it just pisses me off as to what goes on out there. He never showed me how to adjust it. Nobody ever told me about oral appliances. I hear this all the time. Patients come into me. They've had CPAP. They even look to go for to get Inspire. They look at any possibility, but nobody even told them about an oral appliance. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's like some doctor telling you the world is flat. I mean, I don't know what they're talking about. So again, my solutions for the MDs are educate the physicians on a pro- proper protocol, refer patients back and forth, treat together with constant communication, befriend them, build a relationship, supply them with appliance samples. I like to build patients in network whenever it's possible. I know it's very difficult, and we'll talk about that shortly. Also, be provide literature and be qualified. So according to American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, dentists who hold the designation of qualified dentist or diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine are deemed qualified to screen for OSA, snoring and sleep-related bruxism. And I 100% agree with that. So awareness solutions. You know, I thank Inspire. You know, I, I don't endorse Inspire, but I thank them because they're on doing commercials all the time, raising awareness for sleep apnea. I have so many patients that come to me and say, well, I heard this commercial on TV about Inspire, and I realized I had sleep apnea. I wanted to come in. Um, and I, as, um, you know, we talked about some of this before, everybody screens and wearables are tremendous these days, tremendous tool. I mean, the new technologies are just tremendous. I mean, there are about 20% of the population uses smartwatches and fitness trackers at this point. And this this actual study goes into who actually uses it, you know, more high income, high education, more women and men, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are great features about using wearables. There are some negatives at all also. Um, orthosomnia. I mean, the doctor I work with said it's not real, but I 100% it's real. People have an abnormal obsession about their sleep and they come in for, they see a, a slop drop in a sleep stage or something and they come right in scared to death and they want to get treated. I mean, it is good and bad to it, but it's probably here to stay. Talk about medical insurance for oral appliances complicated. Um, I Again, I try to bill in network, but it's hard getting a network for some of the insurances. And if you bill out of network, there may not be benefits or there may be high deductibles. Um, if you get in network, there may be low in reimbursement. Some medical insurances are asking for ridiculous documentation and sometimes they deny for no particular reason. 
And one of my pet peeves is many medical insurances require PDAC appliances. And that it really is one of my pet peeves. And I'll talk about that. Medicare was really the beginning of all the problems here. I mean, they, many commercial insurers go by Medicare standards. So they require that PDAC appliance. They also have a same and similar clause. In other words, if you had an oral appliance in the last five years, well, the first year you're able to get, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. If you had CPAP within a year and you return it, you can get an oral appliance. If it goes over a year, from year two to year five, you cannot get therapy unless the patient pays for it. So I stress to my doctors, you know, if they don't, if they fail CPAP, get them over to me right away so we can get them into another treatment. Otherwise, they could be screwed. Um, with Medicare, you also need a sleep test within a year. And there is a five-year lim limit. So again, if you had CPAP and oral appliance, you can't get anything else for five years unless it's returned in the first year. So we talked about PDAC appliances. Uh, the main feature about a PDAC appliances to me is the fact that they need a fixed mechanical hinge. And we'll talk a little about appliance selection right here. And we'll talk about the fixed mechanical hinge shortly. So the types of appliances, first you know, non-custom appliances, which you can get in your drugstore online. They feel prefabricated, it's inexpensive. They're patient or chair side fitted. They're bulky, poor retention, poor compliance, and not very effective. So I personally never recommend them. I mean, I hear too many problems with them than the benefits. The other appliance types are, well, other than a boil and bite, there's a tongue retaining device, which we mentioned. Um, there's a custom-made oral appliance with no jord, which is adjustment, which is called the monoblock type of appliance, and the appliance which we all do, which is the titratable appliance. The tongue retaining device has been shown to be less effective, despite what that doctor upstairs from me said. It does hold the tongue outside of your mouth. I had a patient today that says that it caused her all sorts of problems. She tried it in the past and caused her all sorts of problems. It may be utilized for maybe completely edentulous patients, although I have never done that. But you can get a lot of discomfort and cannot breathe well through your mouth. You're, you can't breathe at all. So EO486 is the code that is the payable code for oral appliances. This is what PDAC considers um, to be the payable code. So it usually requires that fixed mechanical hinge. Now in the diagram on the left, on the right, you can see that middle hinge on the side. Those are your conventional EO486 uh, appliances. The one in the middle is a nylon appliances. And um, I just like to say that I am on the advisory board for that company, but I'm not trying to push it. It just got PDAC approval. Is that a fixed mechanical hinge? Well, that's debatable. I mean, that that hinge sl slaps in, slaps out. Even a metal hinge, you, you could just take a screwdriver and take that whole thing off. So what is the definition of fixed mechanical hinge? Nobody really knows. But Medicare's infinite wisdom, they choose which appliances will be paid and which appliances will not be paid. So there's a new code in town, the K1027 code. And these are two samples of a K1027 code. Now, do they have fixed mechanical hinges or not? Well, it's debatable. I mean, the one on the left looks just like some of the other appliances that were approved for EO486. But Medicare decided it's not EO486. This appliance just got approved as an EO486 appliance. It's uh, the Glidewell Silent Night. Um, that's a plastic hinge on the side that comes out. You put a new hinge in to change the amount of protrusion. In no way is this a fixed mechanical hinge, but yet it got approved for EO486. The insanity of it all makes me sick. As I told you, I'm a complainer. Let's talk about demagogues a little bit. Uh, this is something else that pisses me off. And this is why I joined the annual meeting committee and got so involved in these things, creating CE programs. I hate demagogues. They talk about subjects, which is no evidence. 
I mean, a perfect example, I think, is the agar appliance. I mean, this is on, under FDA scrutiny now. Um, the inventor was claiming that this cures sleep apnea. And it's not even FDA approved for anything. And it was showing a lot of damage to the teeth. And a lot of dentists follow people that talk, even though there's no evidence to show that these things are effective. And that's one example. I'm not picking on the agar appliance. There are a lot of things out there. I hear it all the time. You know, and people talking about things that have no evidence about it. So my goal as chair of the annual meeting committee is to make sure everything is evidence-based. And that's our importance of the annual meeting committee. It is a scientific committee convention and everything should be evidence-based. And again, I said to beware of education you've been given by companies selling products. Yes, you can learn something, but be very careful. Okay, so lastly, I want to talk about, um, you know, a case study I had. So this was a female, 48 years old, 5 foot 5 inches, 140 pounds, so not obese. She had no gasping or snoring, no comorbid medical conditions. Um, she did have daytime tiredness, but there are many causes for daytime tiredness. She was actually screened in one of my offices by the hygienist. The hygienist called me in. And so what do you think? She's a lot. She's very tired. I mean, I looked in her mouth. I didn't see anything that would indicate visually that the patient had sleep apnea. But I sent her for a sleep study uh, to a physician. Um, and then I didn't see her for a while. And then she came back to the hygienist again for her regular cleaning. And the hygienist pulled me back in the room. And the patient told me, well, she tested and she was had severe apnea. She was given a CPAP, but she couldn't tolerate it. She gave back to CPAP, and the, the physician did not recommend her do anything. I mean, again, I'm complaining again because this should never happen. Some treatment is better than no treatment. So as I said, the physician didn't do anything. And the conclusion of that is... The patient with CPAP and Tylenol, she returned to CPAP, no alternatives given. We made her the oral appliance. It normalized her tiredness. And she's very happy. But if I didn't go back into that room and talk to her, you know, she may be having a stroke right now. Who knows? I mean, one of the other issues I have, I mean, which makes communication very important with physician is their interpretation of success. And this is always a challenge for me too. So again, it goes back to communication. Some physicians, if you get an AHI of 50 and you make it 10, is that a success or not a success? I've had physicians send them back to me, can you move it forward more to get even a better result? And in that, that particular case I'm thinking of, no, I couldn't. That was the max the patient thought they could tolerate. And the symptoms were resolved. The patient was feeling great. But yet the physician sent it back. Now, all other physicians may say, well, you cut the apnea in half. That's good enough. Or the symptoms are resolved. That's good enough. Or, you know, there are different definitions of success. So, again, communication with physician is very important. So set your goals. Understand what you're doing. Work on that patient together. Now, I know I'm way over time here, I believe. So I just want to thank everybody on this meeting. And I always include a slide of one of my trips. I love to travel. So I thought of something that may be related to sleep apnea. And I find the reclining Buddha in Thailand. So I just took a picture of that. I used to have some funkier slides up there, but I, I'm sparing you. So anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And by the way, you know, I know it's supposed to be a Q&A now. But listen, I'm happy to listen to you guys and get ideas from you about what you think would be good CE for us to run in the future. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. My goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is worth uh, the technical issues I had. So thank you. Thank you so much. My goodness. We have not heard uh, on Airway Circle yet from somebody that knew so much about oral appliances and it's so needed. You know, we're all in this world that anybody that walks through the door needs expansion. So to see different alternatives, what are some other treatments for 
uh, always say this is fantastic thank you so much guys i'm going to invite everybody who's live on zoom right now uh, if you're comfortable turn your cameras on uh, turn your mic on and let's um, ask questions if you'd like or uh, recommend some courses this is uh, a great great question anybody you, of course thank you so much for explaining the insurance side of things yes oh, we yeah. have a for me that's the most complicated aspect of practicing dental sleep medicine there are very few practices out there that are fee for service i mean it's just hard to get volume that way so for me being in network is very important to create a volume type of practice to minimize the cost to the patient. So I, I always try to do that. But uh, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Michael has a question, Steinberg. Treating TMD and sleep and or sleep disorder breathing is always is sleep always treated first. Um that depends. That depends. I mean, I have some severe sleep TMD patients that I can't treat with an oral appliance, you know, without causing pain. So I would get them treated for the TMD first. It, it depends on the severity and the reason for the TMD. So yes, there are patients I do treat with TMD and sometimes the oral appliance resolves that. But on the other hand, you know, there are cases where, you know, I see that this is not going to work without intervention from a specialist in that area. Um, he, let's see. Does the AADSM mastery program adequately addresses diagnosis and treatment of TMD? Uh, I personally have never taken the mastery program. The reason being, it's only been around, you know, I don't know, five, seven years. I don't even know. Um, and when I took it, um, I wasn't, I, I had to do it a different way. I actually flew all over the country taking courses to learn. Uh, I think the mastery program is a better way of doing it because you have, uh, you know, agenda during a mastery program. They teach you what you need to te be taught. Um, as far as what they teach about TMD, I'm not entirely sure because, again, I have never attended it. So I don't know if they adequately address that or not. So I have to plead uh, ignorance to that question. Uh, let's see. We had a couple other questions. Does anybody want to recommend a course for the AADSM? Um, what types of airway collapse will a neural appliance not be appropriate for? It's a great question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? What types of airway collapse will a neural okay. appliance not be appropriate for? Uh, well, that, that's uh, see in. With me, I do an oral plans for pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, unless they have a lot of pain when they protrude or something like that, or arthritic joint, that that's issues I don't want to deal with. Um, as far as something like where they say, why wouldn't you use Inspire because of concentric collapse or something like that? Mm -hmm. But we don't do dice, you know, for oral appliances. So, you know, it, it's basically where the obstruction would be. I mean, if the obstruction is more to hypopharynx and oral plants would not work, but we don't know that. So again, I would do the oral plants for all conditions, but yeah, there are cases where it's just not going to work. I do find in the vast majority of cases, it is being effective um, to different degrees. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we get the AHI under five, but again, if I start with a hundred AHI and I get them down to 20, that patient is a hell of a lot healthier than he was at a hundred. So mm -hmm. it's all relative. I don't worry about where the collapse is when I do an oral appliance. I just do the oral appliance. I mean, the old days they had the, with the matrix system. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where it was a like a uh, oral appliance with a sleep tech monitoring it during a PSG. And he was able to evaluate how well the oral appliance is working by seeing what, what was going on there. So, but that company is no longer existing, but we did mm -hmm. used to use it to try to identify which patients would not do well with an oral appliance. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways we used to use, but right now, not really anything. So um, this follows up perfectly with the next uh, questions that we have, which is 
what metrics or data should be used to determine effectiveness of a Nora appliance, and should a sleep test be repeated following a Nora appliance introduction? Well, 100%, yes. I mean, a sleep test always needs to be followed by oral okay. appliance therapy. And repeatedly, not just once. I mean, I have plenty of patients. I go by the symptoms mm-hmm. you know, in the office. I don't do any testing myself. So I go by the symptoms. If the snoring is alleviated and that was their chief complaint to start off with, then I'll send them for the sleep test. If the sleep test shows that the patient is not doing as well as the physician I believe they should do, then mm-hmm. they're sent back to me. I titrate them more. And then eventually I send them for another sleep study. So the sleep studies have to be continuous. And even when we're done, we get to the position we need to be. It should be done annually from there, there on. So it's because things can change, you know, with, with a lot of things. And as far as the metric, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any good metric. Oxygen desaturation is you know, probably becoming more of an important metric than the AHI is. They're making AHI less important these days. Yeah. But it still is a guideline that we use to show mm-hmm. efficacy. I'm my thing is to look at the symptoms, find out what they were being bothered with in the first place, if they're being fixed with that. Then you have a happy patient, and then we send them for the sleep test and see what the doctor says. It's really not my thing to decide um, if it's being effective. Let the doctor fi- fix that. Let let him talk to me, and let's figure it out together. Perfect. Uh, does your appliance therapy include two appliances, night and daytime? No. <laughs> I, I mean, some people have TMD appliances. They were during the daytime. But no, it's, it's just a, a nighttime appliance. Um, I do, if somebody had Invisalign, for instance, I'm more concerned with tooth movement. In that case, I would instruct them to use their Invisalign retainer for several hours during the day when, when they wake up. But I do not make uh, an appliance for the daytime. Um, it's strictly for nighttime when they sleep. No mm-hmm. other reason. And take it out and go on until the next night. So there's not a repositioner in the morning? Well, that it, there are AM aligners, AM repositioners. Yes, in the morning. Yes. Uh, okay. I wonder if that's what she was talking about. I don't um, know. <laughs> how do you speak to the question of long-term use of an aura appliance? And how there can be a negative effect uh, or a retractive effect on the maxilla? Can this be avoided? Yeah. So obviously there can be tooth movement long term. We have the patients come back annually, um, the first time six months, and then annually thereafter to monitor this. I instruct my patients to observe their their jaws and their teeth to see if there are any changes, and if there are to come in to see me. Um, if changes are unfavorable, they're instructed to discontinue use. Um, often they don't care. I've had lots of patients with, you know, a lot of tooth movement, some worse than others, because mainly the ones that have a lot of tooth movement, because they don't use that AM aligner in the morning. Mm. So I, I reinforce that they use that, but you can have tooth movement no matter what. Um, but they don't want to give up their oral appliance. They're so happy with it. It changes their lives. They rather breathe and sleep then have a crooked smile. So that's, I mean, one thing is a lot more important than the other. You know, be able to have, live a normal life. I, I don't care. I mean, I care, but I don't care as much as you think I would care about the position of the teeth. Very good. Uh, one more question and then we'll go. Let's see, there's so many good ones over here. Uh, how do you help patients obtain coverage if they have abnormal findings on the sleep, a sleep test but do not qualify as having OSA, for example, UARS? Or do you have AHIs that enable a diagnosis of mild sleep apnea? Yeah, so these days, and this has changed since I started practicing, patients with UARS are usually covered at this point. Um, mm-hmm. it, they usually go by the AHI or RDI. So because of that, I usually can get most of those patients covered um, for the appliance. So I'm not concerned. Mm-hmm. The only ones we can't get cover, covered is if the HI and RDI are both under five, then we would have a problem with that. I mean, does that answer your question? I'm not sure if I answered it all or not. Yes, I think so. 
Um, you mentioned a little bit about kids. Do you see kids in your practice at all? Oral appliance is only FDA approved for people for over adults. 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I do not see kids in my practice. But being having early intervention, I can't stress the importance of that. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's why we could creating this pediatric course. There's a lot of interest in that because I, know, I'm so excited. <laughs> I mean, what you do in childhood could affect patients life. For, so if you could fix them in childhood, you're saving them so much aggravation in later years. So, I mean, I, 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 I can't say enough about that. So to answer your question, not, no, I do not see kids. I do not treat kids. But if I see a parent, <laughs> I, I start talking to them. If they indicate, well, the child has this. And I get a lot of parents coming up to me and say, well, my child is restless. They, uh, they snore. They, uh, you know, and they come up with me some crazy stuff. Oh, when they have a cold, they snore. Okay, big deal. Um, but, you know, they're... So many times I've get people coming up to me because they consider me an expert. I don't mm -hmm. consider, consider myself an expert, but they consider me an expert. And I will just suggest, you know, hey, if you're concerned, get yourself a sleep test. Find out what's going on yeah. with the kid. You know, why not? Very good. And my functional therapy. Now, now that you know. And, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and by did I mention that we have a Maya functional therapist speaking at our <laughs> pediatric course? Did I yes. mention that before? Okay, so I'm on your guy's side. I, I'm a, a, a friend here. I'm <laughs> trying to promote whatever works in this world. And I'm sure you share my frustrations as a myofunctional therapist yeah. to get yourself more accepted by the physician community. So, uh, yeah, we share we share that. I mean, we're on the same team here. Yeah. So I, mean, I just want to tell you that I'm a friend to you guys. <laughs> yes. It is crazy that you, as a, as a doctor, has a hard time speaking to the sleep physicians. Can you oh. imagine us as my functional therapist without a DR in front of our name? <laughs> I, I know. I, I honestly, I really find that hard to imagine how difficult it can be. Because as I say, I go to doctors and they don't want to hear about it. They don't. They don't believe in it. They, I mean, all sorts of crazy, dumbass comments. Excuse my language. <laughs> I tend to say it like it is. I told you before, I'm a complainer. So. Uh, well, anyway. Well, complainers tend to find solutions, so. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I, I, my goal to find a solution is actually to infiltrate from inside and change it from the inside. That's the only way to make changes. So I'm working my best to make that happen, to make our meetings better, to mm -hmm. create awareness, to make the sleep medicine community stronger. I'm working on all these things, but I'm only one person. I'm doing my best. I know, Renata, you're trying hard as well. And I appreciate your efforts as well. Of course. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. People are saying marvelous webinar. webinar. Thank you. Very informative. Um, next week, we have Dr. Damien Theo. And World Sleep Congress is in Rio, October 21st to October 25th. I also put a link in the, the chat for our new t-shirts, uh, When the Tongue Lives Slow. When the tongue lives low, the palate won't grow. So go get your shirt and give that to your <laughs> referring professionals, referring providers. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for staying late with us, Dr. Arthur. This was fantastic. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate uh, giving me time. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.